This is the oil episode. People seem to have very strong opinions about oil. I got three grades of oil here. We're gonna talk about why I bought all this oil all at the same time. Yeah, I got two airplanes, but that's not it. We're gonna get into that. And the bogey just hit 11 hours, so we changed the oil. We sent in a sample to Blackstone for oil analysis. So let's get into all the details. Okay, as I mentioned, the bogey has 11 hours. I meant to change the oil at 10 hours, but I think that's my first point is, and I don't mean to preach here, but be on a regular program, but if you go over by an hour or two hours, that's okay. But I sent the oil into Blackstone and stay tuned to the end because we're gonna get into the analysis of what it means for this engine and kind of why I do that. But while we're here in the hangar, I'm going to talk about uh, how I got all this stuff and why I got all of it at once. Okay, you might have seen on the shipping label, aircraft spruce and specialty. Okay, I'm not sponsored by them or really anybody regarding the oil. The only folks I wanna thank is Lyft Aviation. So go here for a link to 10% off. Lyft Aviation has an awesome new lineup of active wear. So go check them out as well as ton of other stuff, including the helmet that I wear, shoes, and pilot gear, etc. Now, aircraft spruce and specialty, not only did they give me a military discount, thank you, it's very small, two, three percent, but every bit helps. But if you order over, I can't remember what it is, $250, $300 or so, if you're in the United States, it's free shipping. So kind of stocking up here. And of course I get to the hangar and I'm like, oh, I needed cotter pins at like, you know, weigh nothing, and I should have added that to the order with free shipping, but now I'm gonna have to pay shipping for those bad boys, but it always happens that way. So let's talk brake in oil. So, brand new engine, I'm breaking it in. This is Philip 66 Type M. It is a 20W50, so multi-grade mineral oil. There's other mineral oils that are great, it just doesn't have the additives uh, that will get in the way of the, the brake in process. So I've got nine quarts here it calls for eight it kind of breathes out some its happy point is about seven quarts we'll see but that's the joy of kind of learning a brand new airplane is every air engine every airplane is different they have a happy medium of, of where they like to to sit regarding their oil level so that will get me through the next 15 hours so i'm going to do break in or consider engine break in done or at least changing out the break in oil at 25 hours so 15 more hours on the next set of oil but definitely want to get the oil that was out of it for the first 10 11 hours and cut open the oil filter so we're going to get to that as well i've never done that so i'm going to have my friend darren show me how to cut open the oil filter run a magnet through it and see if there's actually anything macroscopic that you can can see um, and then the microscopic stuff and the chemical analysis happens later. The other types of oil I've got are W100 Plus. So that is a summer oil, okay? Single weight, it's got the additive, anti-corrosion additive, which I probably don't need as much as I fly and as much as we're in a dry environment here in Central Oregon. Oregon, you think of wet, it is not wet. It is a high desert here in Central Oregon, east of the Cascades. But I've always run AeroShell W100 Plus in the Bonanza in the summertime, been very happy with it. Some people run multi-grade all year round and that is just fine. But for wintertime ops, I do run the multi-grade. So the W15W50 w from AeroShell and I've been pretty, pretty happy with that. So I'm gonna run both these aircraft on that same kind of program. Summertime, we're gonna run the single weight uh, 100W plus, and then wintertime, we're gonna run the W15W50. Uh, I might just get lazy at some point and just run this, especially if I start flying less and I'm not as regimented as changing my oil in the fall and the spring, right? And switching out the, the grades of oil. Let's talk about timing wise. I try to change my oil every 30 hours, again, break in aside for the Bonanza, I change it about every 30 hours. People, you know, the most regimented people are on a 25 hour, um, and then, you know, lesser people are on a, on a 50 hour. There's nothing wrong with that, especially if you get that engine analysis. If you burn the, the jopes, as we called it in the Air Force, right? They're, they're burning it and they're doing a spectral analysis to see what chemicals and what metals that engine is producing. Okay, so each each component of the engine has a different metallurgical makeup and different alloys. And that's the beauty of it is if you see a certain alloy is spiked, that can be an indication of excessive wear on a valve, on a crankshaft, on X, Y, or Z. And so, uh, so the company I've been sending it to is Blackstone and they've, they, they track by tail number and serial number and they actually have a human in the loop who is kind of looking back at the history of this engine and the overall 
um, time on the engine, whether or not you've had any cylinders swapped out, how many quarts of oil did you have to add before the last oil, or between the last oil change. So all those sorts of things are taking into account and they're gonna have, again, a human in the loop type you up a paragraph of say, hey, this engine is showing a little bit more wear, nothing to worry about yet, but let's keep our eye on this. Or, you know, for example, after I went to High Sierra Flying, I had a, a raised L, uh, amount of, can't even remember what, whatever that silt is on the playa floor. And that's okay, right? I got a little bit out of the en engine, changed out the oil, and we saw the little spike in that, but that's okay. And it, and it gives you a trend analysis in the ultimate hopes of preventing a mishap in the future so that you can actually take action before something gets out of control. Now, hopefully you're not having to rebuild or, or replace an engine, but you can maybe bore scope it or check a valve or, or you know, focus in on an issue that could produce an issue later on. I think it is totally worth it right now. In the US dollars, I believe Blackstone is charging $35 for an oil analysis. I think that is, I consider that an insurance policy and peace of mind. Okay, oil filters, I'm not, you know, tied to any of these, but these are just the types, this is the type that came on the Titan Continental IO 340. It's a temp, uh, Tempest AA48108-2, and then essentially the same spin-on oil filter. Uh, it's a 48109 for the Bonanza. A little bit larger, obviously. It's IO520 in that uh, in that Bonanza, and then a 340. And I, ironically, they take almost about the same amount of engine oil. So we go through a lot in this in this hangar. But that's all I wanted to get into here. Let's go ahead and head to the computer and take a look at the engine oil analysis from Blackstone. All right, let's go. Learn how to cut this oil filter open. Thanks for showing me how to do this, man. Oh yeah, never done it before. Okay, so if you look closely, you can see there's little pieces of metal. See those? Those little tiny pieces. Ooh, is that bad? Oh, I mean, you're, this is your break in. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna get some pieces. Okay. What, uh, hmm. how many hours are you? 11.1. .1. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, this, this is what you expect. Okay. This is why, one. why you change it early. Yeah. You don't want this stuff. But you can, you can see, I mean, there's definitely some visible particles. Okay. Like, like right there, yep. that stuff? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So we're just getting a feel for, I mean, what, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> <All right. laughs> Clearly we're just, we're just inspecting. We're not going to like send in those particles for analysis or anything, but like how much should I be concerned about this? Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I would definitely talk with, uh, with Blackstone, but I mean, yeah. on your first change like this, yeah. I mean, it's, it's expected to get some material out because I mean, that's all that stuff. That's what you're doing. That's yeah, what's I mean, causing the, the heights causing all of it. Did you bring a magnet? Yeah, I did. It's all fine, fine, fine little pieces. Here, yep. That was awesome. Hey, look, it's my neighbor. Oh, love the smell of jet fuel. All right. So I didn't introduce Darren. Uh, I just didn't want to bug him with this camera in his face and whatnot. I'm so appreciative of him. And he recommended I just keep the filter just in case there's any questions from Blackstone on, you know, if there's any issues that way we have it and they can do some further analysis of metals if they need to, but didn't really get too much on, on that, but that was kind of eye opening. I, I just don't know what I don't know and how much is too much, but we did see, you know, some particulates, some metal particulates in there, of course, but he said that that would be expected. Now, if we see that at the next oil change, eh, probably, probably not the best. So, um, anxious to get the Blackstone report back. So let's, uh, let's go home and check it out. Well, I got the oil analysis enjoying a beautiful view of downtown Manhattan, the world trade center. So got a few minutes on this layover in New York city. Let's get into it. 
So while I use Blackstone, and Aviation Consumer thinks that Blackstone is tops, but that's from a number of years ago, I wanted to point out that there are other companies. And AOPA did an article from about a year and a half ago highlighting the service from ALS, Aviation Oil Analysis, AOA. So I'll link the article um, below on, on the services that they provide. But of course, this is going to be just on what Blackstone provides. So first of all, what does Blackstone provide? This is a sample report, and this is the format that we're going to be taking a look at today. So you've got your demographic data, and then the, the place that I start is their comments. So we'll get to my comments here in a second. And then of course you get into the hard data of all these metals that they're testing for. And this is the, co the column that is the results from your current oil sample. And then here is like the global average from your you know, engine, the type of oil, and you know, the business that you do. And then to the right are the location averages. So we, those will be blank in my case today because it's my first oil analysis so it's the last four and then your universal averages over the life of that engine to the very right so you've got a lot of good data to compare from those are the metals up top and then down here are other uh, you know sources of data viscosity flashpoint fuel percent antifreeze water etc so that's an overview sweet so here is my first oil analysis so yep i'm verifying that everything matches it's my report the demographics are correct it's the correct type of oil the oil use interval yep i only had 11 hours on the oil that's my engine with the serial number number and then i do have the nickel carbide cylinders which is a, a coating for corrosion resistance all right the first thing is i read their comments so their comments really kind of boil it down and give me the layperson an idea of what i should be looking for keeping an eye out for danger danger right so that is the value that that i find that i get from from blackstone so universal averages are on the right and show expected wear for this engine type after about 35 hours on the oil granted i only have 11 hours on the oil this is a break-in sample, so some extra metal and silicon are to be expected, and that's likely what we're seeing here. Note the high copper level. Chrome rings isn't the most common metal to see read high during break-in, but we'll just see if it doesn't decrease next time, okay? Ideally, both chrome and copper should drop closer to averages over a few oil changes. Note, do note the oil's thin viscosity, not due to fuel dilution check back on wear in. Okay, more on that here in a second. So looking down here, I didn't add any makeup oil uh, during the the run of the 11 hours. I started with eight, it breathed down to about seven. I've heard that seven is a pretty happy place for this engine, so I didn't add any makeup to it. I don't think it's like burning oil, I think it's just breathing oil, because every time I fly, it drips a little bit out the, out the breather tube. There are the numbers, and we're kind of looking and seeing if anything catches our eye between you know, my data and then the, the universal. So this is quite low. Lead um, is, is a bit lower. That's fine, probably just because there haven't been any buildups uh, from the lead and the gasoline is my guess. And again, I'm a, just a lay person, so I'm not an expert on engines, as you well know. So they pointed out copper, chrome. So let's look at copper. Copper's at 23, and yeah, look at that. So and your universal average is eight. So, um, I do did pull up that one article um, I want to show you here. This AOPA article does show some things reference to some of these elements. So copper, bushings, bearings, brass gears, starter adapters, and oil coolers. Okay, so bushings, bearings, they're brand new. I think, you know, that's to be expected. The other thing they said was a little bit high was chromium. So eight uh, so twice the universal average. So let's see if they have any blurb about chromium piston rings, chrome cylinders, valve guides, and valves. Okay, so we're just keeping our eye out and uh, ensuring that those things don't continue to be elevated in the next few oil changes or don't start coming down in the next few oil changes. Silicon, 13 over 12. Okay, so it's barely high. So expected that to be a little bit higher, in fact. Oh, this is super low. So phosphorus is three out of 207. So let me know in the comments uh, if that's concerning or a good thing that that's low or just the fact that it's a new engine. That's my sus suspicion. Okay, so speaking of sus, uh, viscosity at 210 degrees 
Fahrenheit. And the 79.2 value should be between 82 and 105. That is just slightly low. And here's my thought on that, doing some, some reading about low viscosity on another website. It's either fuel contamination, so fuel percentage is low. So it's clearly not fuel contamination unless it had fuel contamination at some point and it's evaporated. But I really don't think so, given the fact that all, obviously the lead was low as well. So here's my point is low viscosity, according to another website, can be low based upon cracking of the molecules because of high temperatures. And the, if you recall, the first few hours of running this engine was the expected super high cylinder head temperatures. So pushing that red line of like, you know, 455, 460, 475 is the red line for this particular engine. So um, I'm thinking that potentially the molecules got broken down, which is another good reason to do an early oil change when you're breaking in an engine. 11 hours in my case, 10 hours ideally. And then the other reason is if you do, if you are producing metal, making metal, you're gonna clean out that stuff as things are changing rapidly in the first few hours of, of an engine. Okay, if I didn't emphasize it enough, I am not an engine expert. We all know that I'm more of a stick monkey, I'm into flight tests and all that stuff. So uh, hopefully we, you guys are learning something. I'm learning something every single time I read these reports, but I, I look at this as cheap insurance. It's somebody looking over my shoulder to ensure that, hey, the engine's looking pretty good. It's wear is normal or ooh, we're spiked. Keep an eye on this or dude, it's time for a top overhaul, for example. So that's it. Hope you guys got something out of this episode. More flying next time. Till next time, it's Steve, your clear director.